I'm Bob Riley, director of the Westminster Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to our online series of lectures during this uh, difficult time that we're all enduring. And I'm particularly happy to welcome back David Goldman uh, to the Westminster Institute. David gave a lecture on will China overtake the US as the world's leading superpower back in 2017. It's one of the most popular videos we've ever put up on our YouTube channel. Uh, it gained more than 87,000 views and it's an evergreen. People keep watching it uh, and you will too, I'm sure. After seeing uh, this presentation, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch David's other presentation. Now, David was a mystery man for quite some time. He wrote a profound column on strategic affairs in the Asian Times under nom de plume Spengler. Those of us who followed foreign policy strategy uh, avidly read that column and wondered who could this man be who is so well versed in history, uh, demography, uh, military affairs, the Middle East, Asia, Europe. Who could have such comprehensive knowledge in this, these subject matters? Well, the answer finally came when Spengler was unveiled as none other than David Goldman, who continues to write, of course, in the Asian Times and many other places. Uh, David is an award-winning Wall Street strategist. He's advised the US National Security Council, uh, the Department of Defense, and institutional investors globally. He's the president of Macro Strategy, a senior fellow of the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs in the Middle East Forum, uh, among other institutions. His book, How Civilizations Die, appeared in 2011. In terms of his new book, I'm just going to read one endorsement from a mutual friend of David's and mine, Dr. Larry Arn, who's the president of the Hillsdale College. Here's what Larry says about David's new book, quote, David Goldman has lived in, visited, watched, and interpreted China for decades. An economist and a polymath, I'll interrupt here to say, I would use the word Renaissance man in describing David. I forgot to mention he's an expert in musical theory as well. Anyway, back to Larry. He, David, predicted long ago the things about China that the rest of us are only beginning to see. And he shows how to redeem that, oh, sorry, in this masterwork, he tells a terrible story and he shows how to redeem that story from its possible end in disaster. If you want to know where the world is going and how to stop it, read this book. And the title of the book is the title of David's lecture for Westminster Institute today, you will be assimilated, China's plan to sinoform the world. David. Bob Riley, thank you for that kind and generous introduction. And coming from another expert in music theory, uh, the mention <laughs> is particularly gratifying. China wants to be the dominant superpower. It wants to take over the world. It wants to assimilate you like the Borg. And it's been gaining on us. In fact, it's still gaining on us. But before I talk about all the depressing things that we, we need to talk about, I'd like to begin on a note of optimism. We've been here before. Uh, back when I was you know, a college student, uh, and Henry Kissinger was National Security Advisor, Secretary of State, and Richard Nixon went to China. In those days, the foreign policy establishment had written off the United States as a competitor to communism, it was the accepted wisdom that America was a declining power, that communism would succeed, and all we could do was delay it and mitigate it through detente and so forth. Now, when Ronald Reagan, of blessed memory, became president of the United States, the first thing he told his national security 
staff was, our plan is we win, they lose. Any questions? And he did that. Now, how did we win? Uh, there are a lot of things we did, but there's one thing that we did absolutely decisively. We made ourselves incomparably the most powerful nation in the world by creating a generation of technology that no one hitherto had imagined. Totalitarians don't care about human rights, they don't care about niceties, they don't care about being perceived as bullies. They are bullies and they revel in it. They respect power. What the United States did in a very short period of time was to invent fast and light microchips, the kind that can be put in the cockpit of a fighter plane and give us look down radar. We invented uh, laser optical devices. We invented the internet. Uh, we invented a whole new set of displays. We invented basically all the smart weapons and systems that made it clear to the Russians by the early 1980s that they would lose a conventional war with NATO and they didn't want to fight a nuclear war. And it was that realization capped by the Strategic Defense Initiative, which promised to eventually make us impregnable from enemy missiles, that broke the confidence of the Russians and led to the collapse of communism in the greatest bloodless victory in American history. Uh, nobody in 1973 thought we would do it, and everybody in 1983 saw us do it. The turnaround was stunning and it was comprehensive because American inventiveness, creativity, and patriotism triumphed over a totalitarian system. So having seen it happen before in my youth, I would very much like to see it happen again. I believe we can do it. In some ways, it's tougher. China is a much tougher kind of opponent than the Soviet Union ever was. Now, having started with the, uh, a forward-looking note and uh, my confidence in the wellsprings of creativity of the United States of America, let's talk about what kind of opponent we're looking at. Uh, a lot of my friends, uh, for example, Senator Ted Cruz, on whose campaign I worked in 2016, whom I respect enormously, are saying China is now what the Soviet Union was in the 1980s. Uh, we're fighting another Soviet Union. It's a new Cold War. Well, there's some truth to that, but I think the differences are, in many respects, much more important. For one thing, the Soviet Union was always a rotten economy. It produced some fabulous engineers and scientists and some very good weapons, but it was never able to produce in depth, and it certainly couldn't compete with the United States in the microchip revolution. Uh, Russians waited in line for hours outside stores with bare shelves. Go to any Chinese city, and you have uh, sh uh, shopping malls everywhere uh, filled with goods from all over the world, supermarkets are full. As a matter of fact, in the past 30 years, the Chinese economy has grown tenfold. And the consumption of the average Chinese has grown eightfold. And there are people who say the Chinese fake the data. Well, I'm sure they fake some of the data. But if you ask any Chinese what life was like 30 years ago, what it's like now, they'll say, well, 30 years ago, we had a shack with a dirt floor and we had a pump outside and an outhouse. And if we saved for a couple of years, you might buy a bicycle. Now we've got an apartment with central heating and indoor plumbing. And if we save for a couple of years, we might buy an automobile. It's the fastest increase in living standards for a large number of people that's ever occurred in the history of humanity at the fastest rate. And it's not simply that China's copied the West, picked up our technology, stole on our intellectual property, and produced some of the gizmos that we know how to produce. That was true 10 years ago. When you're coming from behind and you're basically a primitive co country with no technology, you're going to copy. China has now alarmingly moved beyond copy. There are 10 million Chinese kids who take the university entrance exam every year. And when you look at an economy, the first thing always to focus on is skills. You can destroy everything, but as Germany and Japan said after World War II, if you've got the skills, you rebuild very quickly. Well, China 
has 10 million incoming college students every year. According to the global rankings, many of their universities, particularly their engineering schools, rank in the world's top 20 or top 30 or top 50. Now, only you know, 40 years ago, we had the Cultural Revolution, which raised the university system to the ground and had professors paraded around and humiliated by radical students and sent off to work in the rice paddies to learn from the peasants. In a very short period of time, China has created a world-class university system. How did they do it? We built it for them. Something like four out of five of all of the doctoral candidates in fields like electrical engineering or computer science in the United States are foreign students. And of those foreign students, by far the largest group are Chinese. Now, in the United States, only one out of 20, roughly, uh, undergraduate majors chooses engineering. So our engineering schools turn out doctorates. There aren't any jobs to them. They go back to China. We've created a world-class faculty for Chinese universities, while our own kids aren't studying engineering. Why don't the smart kids study engineering in the United States? Well, because about 20 years ago, our technology companies, in their wisdom, decided that it was a lot more profitable for them to invest in software. Why software? Well, if you add an additional customer with software and they download Microsoft Windows or Excel or whatever it is, the cost of adding that individual customer is zero. So the potential return on equity can be infinite. If you're actually building goods, the cost of additional customers, the cost of the new goods. And the Asians, particularly the Chinese, subsidize heavy industry. So capital-intensive industry migrated to Asia. We lost 10 million manufacturing jobs. The smart money, they're really, the kids who were good at math went to Wall Street, or they coded software for Microsoft and Google, and the universities stopped attracting engineering candidates. So our heavy, our capital-intensive industry has been vastly diminished. Uh, for example, the United States invented the microchip, which is the basic building block of the digital economy. When I was a kid, the United States was the only place that knew how to make microchips. Now we only make about 10% of the world's microchips. The biggest producers are in Taiwan and South Korea, and increasingly the Chinese. So China has put vast amounts of resources into human capital and vast amounts of resources into building up its technology, particularly in the past 10 years. It stopped depending on copying, and it's increasingly developing its own innovations, its own intellectual property. I hear people say the Chinese can't innovate. Well, it's certainly true that Chinese culture is more conformist, people are less likely to take risks, and on average, the average Chinese engineer is probably less likely to be an innovator than the average American engineer, but you've got 1.4 billion Chinese, so among them, there are plenty of innovators. I've met them. I've helped them as an investment banker. I've helped take them public in China. So there are plenty of them. There are a number of areas which the Chinese have concentrated on, which are not simply productivity enhancers, and they're not simply platforms for improved military technologies. They're platforms for taking over the world. And when I say the Chinese want to take over the world, they want to do it the Chinese way. This is not the old common turn of the Soviet Union. It's not a plan to send the Red Army marching into Prague or Budapest or Warsaw and occupy. The plan is to make us tenant farmers of the Chinese system, to make us dependent on Chinese technology, Chinese logistics, uh, and Chinese finance, ultimately. They want to not conquer us, but assimilate us like the Borg. That's how the Chinese empire has always worked. Now, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to take a step back. Uh, as Bob Riley mentioned, I wrote a book about 10 years ago called How Civilizations Die. I was struck by the fact that if you look at, at civilizations in the past, on average, the norm is extinction. We don't have any more Hittites or Assyrians or Sumerians, uh, 
no real Romans, uh, you know, a few Greeks left around. Most of the civilizations of the past have died, and sadly, a large number of them, of their own volition. But China has been around for 5,000 years in pretty much the same form. China's not the kind of civilization, civilization that dies. And it's worth stepping back and say, saying, what, what makes that civilization so enduring? As a Jew, from a people that's more than 3,500 years old, we look at the Chinese and say, wow, they're really old. There are three things about China, which I think sum up why that civilization has been so persistent. One is infrastructure, the second is meritocracy, and the third is family. And I'd like to talk about each of these very briefly. China has a blessing and a curse, and that's its huge river system, the Yangtze and the Yellow River and their tributaries. Because China had so many river valleys and the ability to irrigate large amounts of rice production, China could sustain a much larger population than anywhere else in the world, mainly because rice gives you about 10 times the caloric content per acre that wheat does. So the wheat-based European or Middle Eastern cultures couldn't support China's population density. It, so it always had the capacity for a huge population and therefore huge wealth. But it also had a curse, which is that the river valleys tended to flood. And you might have a great population, but a flood would come along and kill a very large number of your people. Now, the founding of Chinese culture, according to legend, occurred 5,000 years ago when someone named Yu the Great managed to conquer the floods in the Yellow River after a catastrophic Noah-like flood of biblical proportions. And successive Chinese dynasties have based their rule on riparian agriculture supported by water management. The first Chinese emperor, Jin Chi Wang, that's the fellow played by Jet Li in that movie with Brendan Fraser about the mummy returning, 2,300 years ago, sponsored water management projects that turned the dry province of Sichuan in China's west into 4,000 hectares of incredibly productive agriculture, made it the breadbasket of China, and developed the wealth that allowed them to conquer China and become the first Chinese emperor. And successive Chinese dynasties have done this, and none more than this communist dynasty, which has built uh, nearly 100,000 kilometers of roads, 24,000 kilometers of high-speed rail, airports, and other in ports and other infrastructure, which frankly put a lot of American infrastructure to shame. Most of Chinese infrastructure is brand new and extremely good. You've heard about the Belt and Road Initiative. That's a $2 trillion plan that China has to build roads, ports, railroads, uh, high-speed telecommunications, pipelines, and so forth across the Eurasian continent and lock Eurasia into the Chinese economic sphere. This is the Chinese method of governance. That's exactly how a few kingdoms in the Yellow River turned into the Chinese empire and locked everybody in. It's by building infrastructure. So what China is doing to the world is exactly what the Chinese emperors have always done to expand their reach inside China itself. The second theme is meritocracy. To administer a national or imperial infrastructure, you need a lot of smart people. And when you have an empire with 200 different languages and hundreds of different ethnic groups who look to Beijing, the capital, as a tax man that they don't particularly like, you need to align the interests of your cleverest and most ambitious young men, now young women, as well, with the center. So you can see drawings from 2,000 years ago of Chinese kids sitting an example, taking exams to become imperial bureaucrats or mandarins. Now it's called the university entrance exam, the Gaoko exam. And it really is a meritocracy. If you're the niece of a Chinese communist official, you might get rich by getting contracts at a corrupt basis. But the one thing you can't do is get into Peking University, China's Harvard. We're not looking at a bunch of drunken, corrupt, Russian-style communists. 
we're up against a Mandarin elite who are composed of the people who score at highest on national exams in a country of uh, nearly a billion and a half people. Imagine if the entire civil service of the United States were composed of nothing but national merit scholars. I'm not saying they get things right or the Chinese system is particularly effective, but we're not dealing with, uh, with fools. We're dealing with extremely smart and ambitious people. The third thing about China is family. The Chinese economy was never founded on large-scale slave labor like ancient Egypt, which my ancestors got out of, thanks to God and a fellow named Moses, or the latifundia of ancient Greek or Rome. The extended family farm unit was always the cornerstone of the Chinese economy. The Chinese really don't like their emperor. They don't like their political system. They love their families. They look at the emperor as a necessary evil. He's there to stop everyone from killing each other. He's the capo di tutti capi. He's the lucky Luciano of China who stops the underbosses from becoming warlords and starting civil wars, which when you've had a weak emperor in China have wrecked uh, incredible damage on China. So the Chinese tolerate their political system because they look to their families. And China, its strength has been the family, but its weakness is that its hierarchy makes the top man like the head of a national family with little emperors reporting to him. So all information flows up and down, orders flow up and down. No Chinese you've met has, has ever sat on a little league committee, a church committee, a school board. Everything is a top-down system. So you've got the advantage of having smart people at the top and the disadvantage of having a very rigid and inflexible system. That's why I think our system is fundamentally superior and why could, we could beat them, but sadly, we're not beating them now. If you go back again to the Reagan era, when the United States was the wonder of the world, when every smart kid who wanted to start a tech business came to Silicon Valley, because that's where the expertise was, that's where the financing was. We spent the equivalent in today's dollars of about $300 billion a year, about 1.5% of our gross domestic product on basic R&D. And all the major corporations, RCA and General Electric and IBM and just use aircraft and so forth, had corporate laboratories. Bell Labs was the biggest of them. And they employed thousands of scientists and engineers and the Defense Department through the Defense Advanced uh, Research Projects industry, would shower them with money for basic research. That's how we got the microchip. That's how we got the internet. That's how we got the semiconductor laser and optical networks. Every single invention came out of that. We don't do that anymore. We're spending, relative to the size of our economy, about a third as much as the Reagan administration did. And that's the real scandal. And the corporate labs have pretty much disappeared. There is this successor to Bell Labs, which produced so many Nobel Prize winners and so many critical inventions. The assets of Bell Labs were picked up by Nokia, the Finnish uh, telecommunications company, and now they're located in Shanghai, and it's called Shanghai Bell. So the successor of Bell Labs sitting in Shanghai with 15,000 Nokia researchers, Chinese, developing technology for China. Now, the Chinese have not stinted on investment in high tech, either in education or in hardware. People's Congress of China met at the, during the last week of May and announced a $2.2 trillion program for high tech development. So what does that mean practically? The name of China's uh, premier telecommunications company, Huawei, has been much in the news. Well, what does Huawei exactly have in mind? Uh, the U.S. government has said that Huawei is basically an ally or agency of the People's Liberation Army of China, which is probably true, and that the purpose of its dominance of technology for fifth-generation mobile broadband is to allow China to spy on Western telecommunications. Now, Chinese will do, will steal any information they can. But there's a bigger issue here which worries me a lot more than that. That is, 5G is not simply 
a super fast way of downloading your favorite TV show or playing games with virtual reality. Though it can do that. It's about 100 times faster than 4G LTE, potentially. 5G is something like what the railroads were to the industrial economy in the 19th century. You see, once you have the ability to carry vast amounts of data and communicate with almost no lead time, that's called low latency, there's almost no reaction time, you can get machines to talk to each other. You can get automobiles to talk to each other. According to Huawei, and in my book, I interviewed the chief technology officer of Huawei, he's an Australian, worked for Huawei for a dozen years. The point of 5G is that industrial robots will be able to communicate in a way that will allow artificial intelligence to instruct them how to change production processes without human intervention. It will allow doctors to operate on patients thousands of miles away with medical robots. It will allow miners to sit on the top of the surface in a white lab coat with a virtual reality helmet and send robots underground to do the dirty work. It will make possible medical research on a scale we haven't thought about before. Uh, Huawei's uh, big partner in this, by the way, is Philips out of the Netherlands. And their plan is to get uh, a billion people hooked up into Huawei phones, which you, know, you pick up the phone, it takes your temperature with an infrared scan. You put your finger on, on the fingerprint sensor, it'll take uh, your blood oxygen level. You put on an attachment, it'll take an EKG. So all the vital signs of a billion people will be uploaded in continuous time into the cloud. And it will be fed into artificial intelligence services, servers produced by Huawei which also will have your digitized medical records and your DNA readout, which means that the ability of artificial intelligence to correlate the effects of prospective treatments, drug interactions, do pharmaceutical research, look for cures for genetic diseases, will be at a level that we've never thought about before. Now, if you talk to American researchers, they say, we know how to do that. But what we don't have is the data. There's no privacy in China. They can digitize your medical research and sell it to Huawei or whomever else. If artificial intelligence is the motor of the fourth industrial revolution, the fuel is data. And as the chief technology officer of Huawei told me, they want to own the control port, which is the porting and storage of data. So Huawei is not simply a way of stealing information, it's more like Tom Sawyer, who got his friends to uh, whitewash his scent for him. Huawei doesn't think they're going to have to steal the data. Huawei thinks they're going to get everyone to give them the data for free in return for the benefits that gracious and benevolent China awards to its tenant farmers around the world. Now, considering that health is almost 20% of U.S. GDP and will probably be the biggest growth industry in the 20th century, if China gains this kind of dominance in healthcare, the power of its economy will be enormous. And we already see all the big European pharmaceutical companies doing joint ventures with China because that's where they go for the data. So when we talk about a Chinese octopus trying to put its tentacles around the world economy and gain the control points, which will change the way we live, do healthcare, do manufacturing, do transportation. This is a well thought out plan run by very smart people in a very advanced stage. So to quote another movie tagline, be afraid, be very afraid. Now, what does this mean from a military standpoint? Where do we stand militarily with respect to China? Uh, in the 1990s, when the Chinese threatened Taiwan, the Clinton administration steamed a couple of aircraft carriers through the Taiwan Straits, and the Chinese had to back down. They had absolutely nothing to match American firepower. Now, we kind of don't know who has the upper hand in the Western Pacific. The Chinese have developed very sophisticated and accurate uh, surface-to-ship missiles. A lot of people think they can take out American aircraft carriers. American aircraft carriers are sitting ducks. They have a very large number of 
diesel electric submarines, which make about as much noise in the ocean floor as turning on a light bulb. They have very sophisticated electronic warfare devices, and most of all, they have missiles that can take out American GPS satellites. So if in the first few moments of a military conflict with China, all of our communications and GPS satellites were to go down within a matter of minutes, we'd be hard put to conduct a war at all. And if we can't move anything within a couple of hundred miles or more, the range of Chinese missiles, very hard for us to fight a successful war against China. The opinions differ, but last summer, the American Studies Center of the University of Sydney in Australia, our ally, published a report saying in the first few hours of a conflict, China could neutralize every American military asset in the region. Military balance in the Pacific, of course, is complex. So you have to take into account Japan, which has, a, um, which has the best, strongest navy in the North Pacific. Uh, but Japan does not show a great deal of interest in getting involved with this graph of China for, uh, for obvious reasons. So China believes it has its neighbors cowed. It has the United States, if not at bay, at least uh, it has a success, a high degree of uh, uh, area and access denial uh, around its coasts. It has technology the whole world wants. And the United States has been trying to slow this down with a certain degree of success, but in my view, not nearly successful enough. For example, Huawei is, by all accounts, the most advanced technologically, as well as the cheapest provider of fifth generation mobile broadband equipment. When you're talking about a rollout around the world, which is a trillion dollar business, the 30% price or 40% price differential between Huawei and its competitors is enormous. So most of Western Europe has uh, agreed to buy Huawei equipment. We put a great deal of pressure on the United Kingdom not to, and it's possible the UK will not. But Germany, which is by far the most important economy in Europe, is using Huawei equipment and is pretty much hardwired into the Chinese company. And that's not simply because the equipment is good and the equipment is cheap, it's because German companies want to be part of this Chinese-led fourth industrial revolution. Volkswagen is now selling virtu uh, virtually half its cars in China. Mercedes and BMW, which want to become big electric car makers and take on Tesla, are uh, in joint ventures with Chinese battery companies. The Chinese market will be the biggest market for electric cars. So, a lot of European industry is migrating to China because this 5G-centered fourth industrial revolution is being heavily subsidized in China. So in China itself, with 1.4 billion people, uh, they're spending, outspending us three to one on 5G, and they're spending an enormous amount of money on the industrial applications, which make 5G a revolutionary technology just as I said, on the scale of the railroads in the 19th century. So unless the United States has its own alternative technologies, we're not going to be able to stop China from selling technologies that we don't have for very long. And people have talked about uh, how great it would be if Ericsson and Nokia, the Scandinavian company, were to be substitutes for Huawei. We've encouraged people to go with, the, with them instead of Huawei. Well, China assimilates, it doesn't conquer, and it's doing its best to assimilate the Scandinavians. I mentioned that Nokia has its biggest research facility, in fact, the success at Bell Labs in Shanghai. Ericsson, in a couple of years, will have its biggest sales anywhere in the world in China and its biggest production facilities in China. The biggest plant in the world is a super automated new robotics plant in Nanjing, China. So without having our own industrial capacity, our own advanced technology, without beating the Chinese in a game where we used to be the only player, we're not gonna hold back China, not for very long and perhaps not at all. So although I applaud President Trump for standing up and saying things can't go on the way they did with China in the past. We can't stand for this. 
I don't think what he's done has been terribly effective. The fact is, as the dust settles, China's economy is coming back very rapidly because China's authoritarian surveillance state is very good at tracking cases of infection, and the Chinese prepared for this. Uh, China's economy is expected to grow by five or six percent this year. Our economy is expected to shrink by five or six percent this year. Having moved so many, so much of our industrial capacity offshore in a crunch, that turned out to be a really terrible idea. So I think we have to, I'd like to conclude where I left off. I think we have to look back to what the United States has done so successfully in the past, look to the resources of American ingenuity, but we have to realize that we're dealing with not the Soviet Union with a couple of hundred million people, we're dealing with uh, with China with 1.4 billion people and massive subsidies to build that high technology industry. Now, I'm a free market guy, I always have been. Uh, I don't like the idea of industrial policy, but I have to point out that the United States, like it or not, has an industrial policy. The industrial policy is China's industrial policy. And under China's industrial policy, high tech capital intensive manufacturing migrates to China away from the United States because it's subsidized. And unless we provide the right kind of financial incentives for American industry to build out high technology, capital intensive manufacturing in the United States, we will continue to lose. Tariffs aren't enough. Sanctions here and there aren't enough. It's gonna take us, in my view, a trillion dollars and 10 years to turn this around. Now, considering that we just spent $6 trillion to uh, tide people over through the crisis and bail out financial markets by having the Federal Reserve buy tons of securities, that shouldn't sound like a great deal of money. We still have the credit to borrow that money at very low interest rates. So this is a great time to repair the roof because if we wait, we may not have the opportunity uh, in this way again. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. There's more detail in my book. Thanks for listening and thanks for considering reading my book. David, if I could ask you to comment on a few items, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. In your past work, you have pointed to, well, demography is destiny. The impact of demography, demography on the survival of civilizations. Uh, so could you comment on China's demography and the problem of its aging population? Yes, China, China's workforce stopped growing in the last couple of years. Thanks to the one-child policy, which has to be the cruelest social policy since uh, Herod or Pharaoh, the Chinese have had one child, They've lifted that. You can now have two children, but we don't see people responding to that quickly. The Chinese have learned that in this winner-take-all meritocracy, the most efficient strategy to advance family interests is to concentrate all their resources on uh, preparing one princeling for the college examination. So the average Chinese family spends the equivalent of a year's pay on tutoring, even though schools are free, university is free. And that kind of incentive has created uh, distortions which are probably very hard to reverse. Now, that's going to keep China's growth rate uh, lower for a while. And if China keeps up this way, in 50 years, China will collapse. Unfortunately, it's not going to collapse fast enough to bail us out of this mess. That's a much longer term kind of process. Part of the reason that China wants the Belt and Road Initiative is if they look at their neighbors, you have in Southeast Asia 600 million people who basically come from a similar kind of Confucian culture. They're hardworking, they're good learners, they turn up and work on time. So the first thing China wants to do is absorb those 600 million people of Southeast Asia and put them in a harness. Vietnam has become an industrial power just in the past five years, mainly because China has offshored a great deal of its own labor-intensive industry 
to Vietnam. The same thing is happening in Malaysia. Same thing will happen in Thailand and to a lesser extent in Indonesia, which has, well, a bit more problems than Vietnam. And eventually they'll get to Central Asia and Turkey. So China is dealing with its demographics by imperial expansion as well as internal social policy. It's a long-term threat to China, but it's not the kind of threat that's going to get us out of the uh, predicament we're in now. So you can't count on demographics to cripple China fast enough to help us. If I can, let me also ask you to comment on Secretary of State Michael Pompeo's recent uh, well, <clears throat> formal declaration that the United States is not going to accept Chinese claims for most of the South China Sea? Well, they shouldn't. They're artificial claims. They're based on maps of uh, dubious origin. China never really had uh, a clear claim to the South China Sea. But ultimately, that's a matter of power. Are we going to go to war with China over various atolls? I don't know. Uh, I'm very concerned with how our allies in the region are looking at China. Um, Japan, which is the biggest threat to China, really scares the Chinese. During World War II, uh, Japan killed 25 million Chinese. So they remember that. Uh, Japan has been backing off commitments to the United States, for example, a commitment to install offshore Aegis missile defense systems to defend American bases in Japan. That was a big Chinese demand that the Japanese buckled to. So although Secretary Pompeo is completely right not to accept Chinese claims, which are aggressive and uh, outrageous, nonetheless, what's really going to determine how the Chinese look at this is whether they think we can shoot down their missiles aimed at American aircraft carriers or God forbid American cities. Chinese helped pioneer very fast missiles, the hypersonic glide cruise missiles, which travel at seven, several times the speed of sound. We currently have no defenses against them. Under Secretary of Defense for uh, Research and Engineering, Brian Griffith has talked a great deal about the threat from these very fast missiles. The kind of thing that we did in the 1970s and 1980s, which is to put vast resources into correcting that problem and neutralizing prospective enemy weaponry, is the sort of thing that will really impress the Chinese. And unless we put that kind of effort into it and achieve clear technological dominance in weaponry, I don't think the Chinese are going to care very much what we say because they believe that might makes right. They're going to look at the U.S. and say, what kind of might do we have behind us. That's a very daunting prospect. It seems also the United States is trying to use the human rights issue uh, as a lever against China. Protestations about what China, the mainland China is doing to uh, bring Hong Kong to heal. Uh, American sanctions on Chinese individuals involved in the mistreatment of the Uyghurs. Does this have any perspective effect, or is it? I don't think it has. It certainly won't move the stony hearts of the Chinese leadership. For thousands of years, China has dealt with what they would call unruly barbarians by offering them two choices. One is you assimilate, and the other is we kill you all. If you talk to any Chinese, from a foreign ministry official to a taxi driver, and say, well, what do you think about the Uyghurs? They'll say, matter of fact, well, of course, we're going to kill them all. Of course, they're not killing them all, but they are destroying their culture, humiliating them, uh, diluting their population, and so forth. In the case of Hong Kong, that's a tragic situation because Hong Kong's a British city, not a Chinese city, never should have been part of China. In my view, the worst thing that uh, Margaret Thatcher of blessed memory ever did was to hand over Hong Kong and Kowloon to the Chinese when the British had a perpetual uh, leasehold. They didn't really have to do that. So Hong Kongers, who are basically British res residents of Chinese ethnic origin, have been stuck with the People's Republic of China, which is a roach hotel. Once you become part of China, you never leave. China will go to war 
over the integrity of its territory because it's a patchwork of languages and ethnicities. And every, every ruler in Beijing from the dawn of time has thought if one province can secede, they all will. So we've got to make an example of any prospective secessionists. Now, I think what will happen with Hong Kong is extremely simple. Uh, about a half a million people to a million people will emigrate. Many have already. Hundreds of thousands have left. People who really hate the Chinese system, uh, who want democracy, will come to go to Taiwan or the UK or the United States or Canada. And the Chinese will ship a similar number of people in from the mainland. So you'll have a population transfer, which in fact has been going on for a few years until the Chinese get a population with a majority that supports the People's Republic of China. Again, that's tragic, but this is a city of 7 million people up against a country of 1.4 billion people. It's an anomaly that never should have been Chinese. So I don't think our best protestations about Chinese human rights violation of what is in fact a Western city uh, are really going to do very much. Now, we threatened sanctions on financial sanctions in Hong Kong. We threatened to kick Chinese companies out of American stock exchanges who were going to trade their shares there. The result of that has been that Chinese companies went back to Hong Kong and money followed them to Hong Kong. So the Hong Kong dollar has been very strong and the Hong Kong market has been very buoyant since the United States threatened to kick the uh, Chinese companies out of American exchanges. That's been a case of throwing them into the briar patch. So again, piecemeal actions, reacted, uh, reactions to Chinese barbarities, things we don't like that they do, are not going to add up to a strategic policy. We need a policy to be stronger than China, to be technologically dominant, economically and militarily as we were in the past. Nothing works against totalitarian empires except power and technology is power. Uh, then, even, yes. Oh, what, what about the possible role of Taiwan in such a strategy? Well, Taiwan by itself, uh, I would say Taiwan and Japan together. Taiwan was uh, owned by Japan for a very long time. People speak more Japanese there than English. The, tie, the industrial and economic ties between Taiwan and Japan remain very strong. And Japan is a formidable military power, strongest navy in the region. Its air force could wipe out anything the Chinese can put there. The Chinese air force could destroy Shanghai if they wanted to. I can tell you the Chinese remain terrified of the Japanese. So Taiwan by itself, I do not think can mount a successful resistance against the Chinese mainland. However, if the Japanese were to be involved, the Chinese would be at an enormous strategic disadvantage. That's something we've discussed at length in Asia Times. If you go to our website and look it up, there's a good deal of uh, analysis of that. The problem with the Japanese is they're going to be pragmatic. They're not going to fall on their sword for the sake of uh, the American concept of truth, justice, and the American way. They'll do it if they think America is more powerful. So I think the way to uh, make sure that we have the upper hand, in the, particularly in the Northern Pacific, is technological superiority. I'll give you a simple example. Russia has an, ant an air defense system called the S-400. It's supposed to be very good, probably the best there is. We don't know how good its capacity is to resist American jamming uh, or to deal with stuff. Right now, the S-400, with a range of several hundred kilometers, can sweep the skies over Taiwan. And it's possible that the Chinese now have the ability, the system they bought from the Russians, to wipe out the Taiwanese Air Force uh, from land-based systems based in the mainland. Now, I don't know whether that's the case, and sadly, unless we actually fought a war, we probably wouldn't know for sure. But there are many techniques that are in development. For example, drone swarms, which could defeat the S-400. And if the United States had a Manhattan Project-style program to improve on air defense and basically turn 
all the Russian and Chinese uh, air defense systems in a worthless junk, they would take that very seriously. That would scare them. David, since you mentioned Russia, let my last question be about Russia. Has it pretty much accepted its role as a very junior partner to China? The Russians and Chinese have always disliked each other. They've never trusted each other. We won the Cold War, in fact, in fact, because Richard Nixon had the wisdom to open diplomatic relations with China and uh, create, if not a second front, at least the... Uh, threat of a second front for Russia. But at this point, uh, Russia as a, a hydrocarbon monoculture and secondarily a weapons provider has China as its main market. But China very much wants to get its uh, energy imports overland so the United States can't interdict them in case of war. So they're building massive amounts of pipelines, and Russia now exports more oil to China than any other country, more than Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're also a major weapons provider to China within limits. They don't want the Chinese to uh, reverse engineer everything they have. I think that the Russians are always going to be pragmatic under present circumstances with the hostility prevailing between us and uh, Russia, particularly over Ukraine. Russia has felt itself backed into the relationship with China. Uh, but there's always the possibility of a diplomatic revolution, of breaking Russia away. I think that would really depend on a NATO so strong that Russia wants to join us rather than try to beat us and see its economic future more in the West. Uh, but that's a very long way away. So de facto, Russia and China are now allies, and maybe also Iran. David, thank you very much for that superb presentation, uh, and best of luck with your brilliant new book, You Will Be Assimilated. Oh, Bob Riley, thank you so much for this invitation. Always a great pleasure to talk to you under any circumstances, and thank you all for listening.